Hi, it's Dr. John Raymond Baker, DC, and today I wanted to talk a little about a new treatment, or at least new to me and new to probably a lot of you guys, about uh, treatment of back pain and knee pain, and I assume shoulder pain as well. Specifically targeted toward osteoarthritis. I'm going to re be referring to uh, some of my research because it's actually a brand new uh, treatment idea to me, so please bear with me. And if it's new to you, then we'll muddle through it together. It's called Regenikin, you might say Regenikin. Uh, it's based on an older uh, method called Orthokin, or Orthokin. And it says in the United States it's not Regenikin as far as the Wikipedia. However, it's basically being practiced in, in Germany. But there also is a little bit of a practice of it here in the United States. I believe a gentleman named uh, Dr. Chris Renna has two offices, one in California, one here in Texas. And I believe he's doing the therapy. However, since it's not sanctioned or okayed by the FDA. I don't know if he's had any problems with it yet. Let me take a minute and explain what Regenikin or Regenikin does. And like I say, it's based on Orthokin. Orthokin or Orthokin, I wish I knew exactly how they want it described, um, was uh, a patented method that was developed by Peter Velling, Dr. Peter Velling, who's a spine surgeon in Dusseldorf, Germany. Deutschland, and Dr. Julio Reinecke. And like I say, they're, they're the ones that patented the orthokine. And, it, and I want to describe it, and you'll see why the uh, regenokine is pretty much a lot like it. Uh, orthokine, I'm going to quote Wikipedia's entry, is an experimental medical procedure in which a patient's own blood is extracted, manipulated, and then reintroduced to the body as an anti-inflammatory drug to reduce chronic pain and osteoarthritis. Now, I want to take issue a little bit with, um, with Wikipedia in that if it is a drug, then the FDA has control over it. And they can approve it, disapprove it, outlaw it, whatever. Basically, you're taking tissue from the body in the form of human blood. You're taking it out of the body, you're doing something to it, and you're reintroducing it. Now, is that a drug or not a drug? The FDA talks about that you have to minimally uh, manipulate the substance to avoid becoming a drug because if you take blood and you do too much to it, then you're running the risk of now it becoming a drug and it has to go through the approval process, etc. Now, what is Regenikin and why in the heck am I talking about it? Well, a lot of rich people, especially athletes, have gone to Germany to have the treatment. People like Kobe Bryant. There's um, um, Alex Rodriguez, the famous ball player, and other athletes, even older athletes. I think there was a, a golf player named Mr. Couples or something like that. Anyway, I believe he won a senior open and he went on to say that it was because of Regenikin, this procedure. Basically, they take about two fluid ounces, 59 milliliters of blood from you they take it out, they put it in a test tube or other receptacle, they fractionate it. Basically, they, they separate it into its constituent parts. But before they do that, in the Regenikin, I'm not sure about the Orthokin or not, they heat it up slightly. And it's almost as if you had the blood still in you and you had a fever. Say 102, 103, something like that. So. They, they heat it up and then they, they spin it and refractionate it so that the bottom is the red blood cells. The middle layer is this yellow layer and that's what they're searching to get. And they take that yellow layer out. Now they say that the elements that they want to be in this final concoction, decoction, um, are increased a hundredfold by the heating. And I think it's because it simulates fever in the body. Now you know that if you get an infection, one of the side effects or one of the existing things that happen with an infection is you get a fever. And a lot of times people think, oh, that's just because of the disease and I want to get rid of that fever. Actually, it's your body trying to do some things that will kill the uh, 
it'll be able to kill some of the organisms off with an elevated body temperature. But like I say, they fractionate it, they take off the middle layer that has cytokines, cytokines, and uh, interleukin-1, and they use that to reintroduce it after they've done this treatment into the body through injections. And I think they do five injections, I'm not exactly sure, um, but they do periodic injections and after they finish the treatment I think that often they invite you to come back once a year for kind of like, for want of a better word, a booster shot um, to kind of maintain the, uh, the good effects that you had. Now what are the good effects? Primarily a lot of these athletes and other people that have had it um, are people that have had knee problems, shoulder problems, back problems and of course if you're an athlete and you've got knee problems or back problems it can be debilitating it can mean that your career is cut short so they have a vested interest in being able to continue playing because for them at the top of their game playing could mean millions of dollars and I believe and don't quote me on this that um, the procedure is like seventy five hundred dollars if you go to Germany and that's not certainly not not including your hotel room and the flight and all that, but just the procedure itself, I believe, is $7,500. Um, but it could be more. Inflation hits us all. Now, um, the peop what effects have they had? They basically have said that it helps their pain. Some say it's almost immediate. Some say it takes a few weeks for it to quote-unquote kick in. But the reduction of the pain and being able to move like you were before without the pain is, as I understand it, the best effect of the Regenekine treatment. Now, let's understand a few things about the whole procedure. Basically, interleukin-1 is produced by the macrophages in the body and it's associated with fever in the body. Now, if I don't know if you've seen some of my past videos, but I talked about one of the treatments for cancer that was developed by John B. Coley, MD of New York, so-called Coley's toxins, was a treatment that used erysipelas, which is an a infectious agent that can cause high fevers. And he found that with even with people that had a week, two weeks, a month to live, that there were spontaneous regressions that he was able to achieve from cancer. In other words, their tumors just disappeared and they were fine and dandy by inducing this very high fever. And we're talking the kind of fevers that can send you into convulsions. That kind of high fever. So I believe that fever can be a catalyst in the body to mobilize your immune system to fight some of the uh, infectious agents, to fight some of the, the other problems, to relieve pain eventually and to relieve problems. So, Basically, it's kind of like if you break your arm bad, <laughs> excuse my language, it's going to be horrible. If you break your, your arm badly and it you know, grows back crooked or something, they can quote-unquote re-break it, set it so that it grows back properly. So a lot of these people, at some point, and I, I'm, there's videos from, I believe, Dr. Vessling and others talking about reg Regenekine and how it works. But my own theory, just from reading what I have on it, is that it, if you have a joint, spinal joint, um, appendicular, skeleton, articular joints like in the shoulder or knee, that at one point was injured, it had inflammation, and that inflammation, which was acute, and you gotta understand that usually acute inflammation is proper. It's something you want to have happen to mobilize your body's um, healing defenses, the immune system to go after, you know, if you get a, an arrow in a wound and it gets infected, you want inflammation to start the healing process. But after a certain period, acute inf inflammation, when it becomes chronic inflammation, can dis destroy the joint, can be de devastating. So my theory is that basically you had acute inflammation that became chronic and did destruction of the joints and as a result you're trying to re-stimulate the system as if it's undergoing that original acute inflammation
to get it to try to heal the area in, in a complete fashion in the manner that it was not originally healed when it was acute. And that's kind of my theory about it. Now, there's two types of arthritis, and we're dealing with people with osteoarthritis. The other form, basic form of arthritis is uh, rheumatoid, and that's an inflammatory type of arthritis. And we need to differentiate between the two. A rheumatoid or inflammatory arthritis, the joint gets swollen. You might have seen people with rheumatoid arthritis and they get heberdine in the nose and they get swollen joints and it has all the, the highlights of inflammation. Rubor, it's red. Color, it's hot. Dolor, it hurts. And tumor, it's swollen. Now, there was added another side of inflammation called functional lasa or loss of function and some say that Galen added that to the original four of, uh, of uh, it's the person that did the, uh, the Celsus, oh Celsus uh, but others say that no it wasn't Galen it was somebody else but I don't really care but they have added the functional lasa loss of function of the body part as a fifth element of inflammation which is not always there. You can have inflammation without losing body part function. But at any rate, um, so we have to understand about osteoarthritis. What, Since we're not dealing with rheumatoid, we're dealing with osteo. Osteo is not an inflammatory condition, generally. It's a body part, whether it's a spine, knee, shoulder, that just wears out. Normally, you in a lot of joints, you have a cushioning area between it. For example, in the knee, you've got You've got um, soft tissues that tend to pad and cushion so that the, the surfaces are able to move without hitting against each other. But with someone that has osteoarthritis, you can have the decrease in that joint space. In essence, you have the cushioning area wear out, whether you're talking about intervertebral disc or you're talking about the cartilage in the knee. And it can get to the point where it's quote unquote bone on bone. And your system never was meant to move bone on bone. And that's kind of like fingers on the chalkboard as far as your, your body is. It doesn't like that. And it can cause it to hurt and cause you decrease mobility, etc. So in a lot of these cases, we're dealing with people that have gone to bone on bone. And as a result of that added wear, they can develop spurs, also called osteophytes, and that's uh, a natural outcome of putting stress on a bony, bony structure. Is the bo body says, "Oh, I got too much stress here. I need to put calcium there." So it puts these shelves and these osteophytes. And if it's a, uh, if it's in your intervertebral spine, you can have spurs that form off the vertebrae, and you can get things like heel spurs, and you can get spurs in the knee. But the bottom line is that's more a mechanical outcome of a joint that quit functioning correctly that's got too much wear and tear on it. Now if you take the blood out and you do the stuff to it and you put it back in, are you going to cause those spurs to disappear? Are you going to cause the disc to grow back magically? Not in any scenario I can think of. Um, yeah, it might help your pain, but is Regenekine going to fix um, a structure that now has collapsed and now has got big spurs. In fact, in some cases, these spurs can join and lock that joint down. <clears throat> I don't see a way it could. And in fact, that's one of the reasons people have back surgeries or knee surgeries is mechanical damage that's now pressing on a nerve root or mechanically limiting your motion. Um, so, Regenekine, orthokine, there's other kinds, there's so-called prolotherapy, also known as proliferative therapy. There's also called PRP, or platelet-rich plasma, in which instead of cytokines, they're trying to, to have a plasma fluid with lots of platelets in it, and I'm not going to go into the theory about that, but there's been studies that use the PRP and... Uh, they really didn't have any better outcome initially or in subsequent trials 
than using saline solution. Um, other, other trials have used as an irritating agent in the proliferative therapy, um, sugar water. Um, of course, to me, the same dynamics is you're trying to irritate, inflame it again, so that now it jumps out of the chronic inflammation stage to the acute inflammation stage, which normally resolves. It normally has a good outcome. It's meant to cause healing in the body. And, uh, you know, to that extent, yeah, I can see where that you could get some pain relief. But as far as physically rebuilding that joint, I don't see and I haven't seen any um, um, studies or slides that show me how I can fix that kind of problem. And as I always say, wrapping up this, uh, this is not medical this is not medical advice. I'm not your doctor. Uh, it's not legal advice, and certainly I don't own the copyrights, trademarks, or patents of Dr. Vesley at all. And with all due respect to them, if they're helping people, that's great. But I think we need to isolate what kind of problem you're dealing with. If you're just trying to get them out of pain, then great, go for it. If you're trying to fix a spine that's wore out and now it's bone on bone, if it can fix it, I'd be great to find that out. Now, I will continue tr researching the topic, but as of today, I don't see that that's possible. So, I hope you're having a great day. Thanks for watching my videos. Bye-bye.